This is 9.5 part, part 2, so the second video. And as I in, mentioned at the end of the last recording, um, we're going to reverse where we found an approximation for a series and then try to figure out what that sum would lie between. It's somewhere between our approximation plus the error and our approximation plus the error. Um, and that error amount is less than or equal to the first neglected term. So now I want to go backwards and this next example, example 4, says to find the number of terms required, find n is what that means. The number of terms is n. Find n to approximate the sum of the given series with an error of less than 0 0.0001. So we want our error to be less than 0 0.0001. Okay, so the series that we're working with is this one. It's written uh, so that you can clearly see that it's alternating. And um, let me write that down. And we're not proving that this one converges because if they ask this question of a series, it's implied that it converges to S. And so. Um, we have a sum that is implied in the directions that s that we're going to try to find. So we're trying to approximate the sum of this series. So as we saw from the work last time, the error amount, which is the remaining part of the series after you take off the first n terms, um, is going to be less than or equal to the first neglected term. Okay. Um, and so if we had proven that this one converged or by the a sub n part of it, it's the part that does not involve the power of negative one. And so a sub n plus one by substitution is one over n plus one cubed for this problem. Okay. And we want that to be less than 0 0.0001. So I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides of that equation, the reciprocal of 1 10 thousandth is 10 thousand. And if you recall, I think I've said this before, if not, kind of prove it to yourself. If you take the reciprocal of both sides of an inequality, it changes the direction of the inequality, so it's now greater than. Then um, if I take the cube root of both sides, that won't change the direction of the inequality either. And then to solve for n, we'll need to subtract one from both sides. Of course, that uh, exact answer makes a mathematician really happy, but in the real world, we might want to know, well, what number is that really? So if you put that, in your cal put that into your calculator, that's 20.544. So um, we need at least how many terms? We need at least how many terms? Well, n is a positive integer, and n has to be bigger than 20.544. So that means we have to have at least 20. This is not rounding. Um, if I had said n has to be greater than 20.0001, that would still be 21 terms because n has to be
bigger than that decimal number. And if it were rounding, that would round to 20, but that's not the correct answer. So you want to go to the next integer, very next integer, bigger than the calculated value that you're comparing n to. So be careful about thinking you're rounding here because that's it's a false path and you don't want to take that path. Now, there are some series that are not alternating and yet they contain both positive and negative answers. For example, here's one that does that. Um, it's one to infinity sine of n over n squared. And you know that sine of n is sometimes positive and sometimes negative. If n is a radian value between 0 and pi, for example, it's the first or second quadrant, it will be positive. If, it, if n is a number between pi and 2 pi, for example, in the third or fourth quadrant, the sine of n will be negative. And then dividing that by n squared won't change the sign because the square of n is always positive. So anyway, let's expand this one out. That'll be sine of 1 over 1 squared plus sine of 2 over 2 squared plus sine of 3 over 3 squared plus sine of 4 etc. And what I'm interested in is um, what those are as decimals, so you can see what kind of numbers we're getting. That one's positive. That one's positive. So this cannot be alternating, because if you have two positives in a row, it doesn't alternate between positive and negative. So that's a, a pretty clear indication of what's going on there. The third one, of course, 3 is just slightly smaller than pi. So this is still positive because we're not yet to pi, where sine would be 0. And then oops, that's, uh, let me read those to you if you can't read my handwriting. 0.841 plus 0.227 plus 0 0.015 minus 0 0.047 minus 0 0.038. The next one's actually negative, and you just keep on going. So this is not alternating. Um, so it's not an alternating series, and we can't use the alternating series test. What we can do, and a lot of times if we have series that are that contain positive and negative terms and not an alternating form, then what we can do to investigate the convergence of that series is by looking at the sigma expression of the absolute value of that declaration of what that formula is that produces our terms when we put in 1 and then 2 and then 3 and 4 etc. Take the absolute value of that. So to investigate that, oh I forgot to write the end. Dang it. Hold on. Oh, went too far. That's sine of n. Okay, there we go. That's better. So, um, let's start with sine of n. And in fact, let's go ahead and put absolute value around it. What can you tell me about the absolute value of sine of n? Well, we know that the range of sine is negative 1 to 1, and all numbers in between, of course. So if we took the absolute value, that would be less than or equal to 1, always. That has to be true. So um, if I were to divide both sides of that equation by a positive thing, like n squared, would change the direction of the inequality. And if I want to, um, I could put that n squared into absolute value. 
because it's already uh, non-negative. It, it won't hurt to take the absolute value. It's not required, but I'm trying to make a point. And of course, uh, absolute value divided by an absolute value means that we can make a single absolute value out of that, of the ratio of those two things. Okay. So, um, and that's a true statement. Just algebraically, we know that that has to be true. So we're, we're using, um, let's let a sub n be our series, absolute value of sine of n. Oh, dang it. Sine of n over n squared. And let's let our b sub n be 1 over n squared. Let's investigate the series B sub n. Well, do you remember what kind of series that is? It has a name. It's a P series. And when we do the P series test, we have to identify the value of P. P, of course, is 2. It's the exponent on n. Um, and since P is greater than 1. We know that um, this converges. Sigma B sub n converges. And if sigma B sub n converges and its terms are bigger than the terms of our series and our uh, comparison series converges and these are smaller values for our series, well, this has to converge. That would imply that um, the sigma of absolute value of s of n over n squared, because those, oh, by the way, um, I, I'm going to need to make a declaration here in a second in hindsight um, because of the test that we're actually using. Do you know what test we're using, by the way? Did you figure it out? I'm going to claim that it converges, but you need to tell me why. What test did I just employ? Start with the D. It's direct comparison. And for the comparison tests, we can only do them if both A sub n and B sub n are positive. And if we look up here, A sub n, since we're taking the absolute value, is positive, and b sub n is 1 over a non-negative number. In fact, it can't even be 0. So b sub n is positive, and that means we're eligible to enter the direct comparison uh, test. So we've shown that that's um, a convergent series. Now, the next thing we're going to have to employ is a new theorem um, it's theorem 9.16, it's absolute convergence is its name, that says that if a series sigma of absolute value of a sub n converges, then the series sigma a sub n also converges. So by absolute convergence, we just showed that the absolute value of s of sine of n over n squared the absolute value of that um, as the terms of a series. Ah, shouldn't try to talk and write at the same time. Okay, so by absolute convergence, because the sigma of absolute value of sine of n over n squared converges, which we just proved. Um, we know that sigma of oops, of that expression without the absolute value, sigma of sine of n over n squared, also converges. 
And so that's a, a nice little thing if you have terms that aren't well behaved. They're not alternating, but some are positive, some are negative. Um, try to look at the absolute value of your terms, like we did here. And if you can show that that converges, then sigma of your original thing would also have to converge by this absolute one to know. Um, the converse of this statement is not true. Um, and I want to give you a, a, an example of that. The alternating harmonic series does what? Remember? We said we wouldn't have to prove it again, but you have to remember the result for it to be much good. It converges. Okay? And the statement of that alternating harmonic series is sigma from n equals 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n. And then think about the harmonic series. The harmonic series always does what? Do you remember? We said once we proved it, we wouldn't have to reprove it. We just need to remember what it does. Well, it diverges. And let's get a sense of what that series was. The harmonic series looks like this. Sigma n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n. So, um, the converse of that statement would be that if we have sigma a sub n converging, then the absolute value of that series also converges. This is the converse statement. Okay, And remember, the converse is the thing that doesn't have to be true. Just because I'm a man doesn't mean that I play for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, if you remember that from earlier. So, well, let's see if we can show a, a counterexample for that, to show that that converse is not true. Because, of course, it can be true. If we pick the right man, he actually is a Dallas Cowboy player. But uh, what we want to show is that it doesn't have to be true for every man. Every man you pick is not a Dallas Cowboys player. So uh, we're finding a, a counterexample. So, um, for example, sigma of a sub n would be like this one. Oh, sorry. I messed up. Um, dang it. Let's make sigma of a sub n be this one. Negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n. Of course, we, we already know that's all alternating harmonic series. So we know that it converges. And because of that, that would imply that sigma of the absolute value of that would have to converge too. And if you take the absolute value of any power of negative 1, you're going to get 1. And if you take the absolute value of n, which is already positive, you'll get back n. And so that's supposed to say that this also converges if the converse were true. Does it? No. This is the divergent harmonic series. So the harmonic series and alternating harmonic series um, are the prime counterexample 
that because the alternating harmonic series, series is known to converge, it, that does not mean that its absolute value expression would have to converge. In fact, it, it doesn't in this case. So um, the converse statement is not true. So if we have um, this kind of situation where the series converges, um, value uh, expression of that series diverges. That's what we call conditional convergence. So again, conditional convergence is when um, a series converges, but the absolute value expression of that series diverges. And so the alternating harmonic series converges conditionally, is how you say that. Uh, so let me write that down. The, harmonic, the alternating harmonic series converges conditionally. It converges, but its absolute value expression does not, and so that's what we call conditional convergence, and that means that it converges conditionally. Now, if, however, um, sigma of a sub n converges and sigma of absolute value of a sub n also converges, then that type of convergence is called absolute convergence. called absolute convergence. And if we found one of those, we would say that that series converges absolutely. Okay, so let's use this uh, definition of absolute and conditional convergence with a few examples. Example five, determine whether each of the series is convergent or divergent. If it is convergent, classify the convergent series as ones that converge absolutely, or those that um, converge conditionally. All right, so example A. N equals zero is the starting point for this one, to infinity, of course, negative one to the N times N factorial divided by two to the nth. So that's 0 factorial over 2 to the 0, because negative 1 to the 0 is 1. Negative 1, just put a minus. That'll become 1 factorial over 2 to the 1st, then plus 2 factorial over 2 squared minus. 3 factorial over 2 cubed, etc. Okay, um, this is an alternating series. Okay, um, a sub n is n factorial over 2 to the nth. And if we took the limit as n approaches infinity of n factorial over 2 to the nth, that's infinity. We actually talked about this earlier when we talked about 
uh, n factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times it's the rest and 2 to the nth is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times the rest. We took off those first four terms. 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 is 24. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. So 24 is bigger than 16. Um, so we know that n factorial grows way faster than 2 to the nth. And so we kind of talked about this earlier, and I'm just uh, waving my hands a bit to say what about, and we're just going to go on. So, um, because that's not zero, um, this series does what? Therefore, this series does what? It diverges. And how do we know? What's the test that we use to say, hey, this one is divergent? It diverges by the term test. Its long name is nth term test for divergence. Okay, so we're done with that one because we only have to decide conditional or absolute if it actually converges. When it diverges, that's not an issue that we have to address. Okay, this one is n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the nth over the natural log of n plus 1. So, oh, I'm sorry, I'm copying that from the wrong place. Um, I got a page ahead of myself, so let me back up. I really don't want to do that one yet, because uh, we haven't built up to it. Okay, this part of it's good, though. My apologies. Over the square root of n. So if we were to substitute 1 in, negative 1 to the first is negative. So this will be negative 1 over square root of 1. And then putting in 2, negative 1 squared is positive. So plus 1 over square root of 2 minus 1 over square root of 3 plus 1 over square root of 4. And some of these could be simplified, I realize. Um, but that's not really the point of this. It's, it's the simplification. Okay. Um, so let's see if this one is going to converge. Uh, it does alternate. Our a sub n is the part of that expression that does not involve the power of negative 1. So it's simply that. Test 1. What is the limit as n approaches infinity? of 1 over the square root of n. That's clearly 0. So we pass that test. And a sub n plus 1, which by substitution is 1 over the square root of n plus 1, will be uh, compared to a sub n. The expression of a sub n is that, which is equal to a sub n. And the denominator on the left and this is the only thing that changes, by the way, when I look at this fraction, is the denominator is the only difference between the two. The denominator on the left is larger than the denominator on the right, which makes the fraction on the left bigger. I'm sorry, smaller. I, I bet. Smaller than the um, fraction on the right. And so um, that checks out. And so that says that this series... Okay, we were told if it converges, we have to determine it. So to determine that, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to introduce absolute value around the expression of our 
series general term. And of course, the absolute value of it, the power of negative 1, whether it's 1 or negative 1, is going to be 1, divided by the absolute value of the square root of something. The square root of something is already positive. Um, if m is positive, then uh, the absolute value is superfluous, so I can just get rid of it. And then I need to find out if that converges or diverges. So this is where you still need to know all of the tests for convergence that we've talked about and know how to look for them. This one is actually writable as 1 over n to the 1 half, which means it's a what? Right, it's a p-series. p-series. Um, Let's see, what is p? Well, p is 1 half. So since p, actually, I don't need the 0, because p is always positive. Forgot myself there for a second. Since, um, I think it, yeah, it's OK to write that 0. It's good. Since, um, in fact, we're supposed to. I just thought about it for a little bit longer. Um, since p is less than or equal to 1, this series that's the absolute value of our a sub m diverges. So since that diverges, but the original series converges, then we'll say that the sigma uh, from n equals 1 to infinity, <coughs> excuse me, of negative 1 to the nth over the square root of n converges how? If its absolute value version diverges, but it converges, it converges conditionally. Okay. Example six. I think I'm getting close to the end. Let's see how much room I have. Uh, I think I'm going to stop this one and do example six in the next video. So I'll see you later.